Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. So hello everyone, welcome to the Piano Tech Radio Hour. My name is Emrys, I'm Ethan's assistant, stepping in for him again this week because he is out of town. Um, so today's uh, Piano Tech Radio Hour will be a recording of a previous conversation that Ethan had and recorded. So in just a second, we will go ahead and get that started. We just have one more person joining. All right, so I will go ahead and get the conversation started for us. Hi everyone out there, I'm Ethan Janney and I am the host of Piano Tech Radio Hour and I am on the road again this week. So we'll be featuring a pre-recorded session, actually recorded a little bit over a week ago. Um, and uh, you'll get to see me in the context of my Disney World vacation with my family, uh, a little peek at that. Uh, a little hint at that, but mostly the episode is about a very talented piano player and Ben Donionist, who we'll introduce later. Uh, but for the time being, what I'd like to do is introduce the show as we do. I would say welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. We gather here every Saturday to meet with and learn from the most fascinating and knowledgeable folks in the piano world. This includes manufacturers, rebuilders, musicians, makers of other instruments, and of course, piano techs. Our mutual goal is to become better at our craft to help each other and to create an ever more musical world together. Piano Tech Radio Hour is brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online learning resource that brings you cutting edge instruction from piano industries masters without leaving your home you can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com this program radio hour which happens every saturday can be also be subscribed to for just 16 dollars a month you get direct access to each week's private zoom call as well as all all archival recordings of over 175 now nearly 190 episodes in our member area you can join piano tech radio hour using the link bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. That's bit.ly forward slash join PTRH bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. Without further ado, uh, let's kick it over to that pre-recorded interview. Okay, everyone. Today's guest is Claudio Constantini. He's an internationally acclaimed multi-instrumentalist known for his exceptional skills, both as a pianist and a bandonionist. Born in Lima, Peru in 1983, he combines classical roots with a passion for Latin American music and improvisation. His performances in renowned venues, collaborations with top artists, and critically acclaimed albums have solidified his reputation in the music world. Constantini's dedication to music education and his unique blend of musical genres makes him a standout figure in the music industry at large. So, Claudio, welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Thanks. It's a big pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's been, been a while since we've been arranging it. You're in a different time zone here, um, yeah. and so it's not always easy. What time is it there, and where are you? Well, I'm at home in Madrid, in Spain. Uh, it's uh, about 8 o'clock here in the evening. Okay, nice. Well, you yeah. have a lovely apartment there. I love that you have the piano open in the background. That's that's perfect right up our audience's alley as piano technicians there. Have you been messing with the insides at all? Is it more about uh, recording or, or the sound? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. well, I, I do love the aesthetics of the of the piano, of the inside of a piano. And um, as you might know, I'm very active on social media and on YouTube. And uh, I usually record my videos here in this room. And I like to put the, the piano, to leave the piano open so that adds a little bit of uh, distinction but I I'm also uh, messing a little bit around with recording because I I try new things every day so I'm recording myself on the bandoneon my other instrument and on the piano and uh, I haven't really got yet the, 
the sound right in, uh, in the piano. So I'm still experimenting with that. And that's why I usually keep it open so that I can easily put the microphones on. All right, excellent. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and we, de we have talked a tiny bit about micing pianos on the show, um, talking with actually another uh, pianist that's in, out of Spain. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, I, I might be blanking on his name right now. He's a jazz flamenco piano player. And, uh -huh. uh, and um, I've actually known him quite well. I'm blanking on his name. But he was living in New York when I met him. And then during the pandemic, he like went back to Spain and, um, and kind of was trapped there or whatever. He had a property and he was staying there. I'm not sure where he is located right now. Um, but I'll bring his name up later. You might recognize it. Um, okay. And uh, and he talked a little bit about how he likes to mic piano. Uh, I do have a couple maybe mic recommendations for you. I'll have to look them up and maybe a little bit of ideas about placement. So oh, that would that be helps. great. It would <laughs> yeah, be great for sure. That. Yeah. So um, I'd love to I'd love to reach back into your roots there in Peru. Um, I'm not sure that we established this already, but I myself actually lived in Peru for about a year and a okay. half. Yeah, this oh. was around 2015, 2016. I brushed up on my Spanish and I actually was calling myself an ambassador of pianos in Peru. <laughs> and so wow. I would tune pianos for, for free, um, just in exchange for the ability to tell the stories of the people and the instruments that I was, uh, I was encountering. And uh, by the end of my journey in Peru, I had befriended a, um, a diplomat uh, that was a piano player, um, and, and um, uh, Fernando Torres Fernandez, or Hernando Torres Fernandez was his name. Um, you mm -hmm. should meet him as a, as a fellow Peruvian. I'm sure you guys would get along very well, a world traveler. Um, and I actually ended up uh, working with the president's pianos in the presidential palace. Uh, wow. by the end of my okay. journey. Yeah, that was, uh, it was pretty fun. So, so I would love to reach back and, and given I have a little bit of exposure to Peru, I'm also curious, what was your life of a developing musician in Peru? You know, education, mentorship, musical influences, environment, what was that like for you? Well, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be born into a musical family. So my mother is an orchestra conductor and my father was a pianist. He was my first piano teacher. But uh, to be honest, I didn't, uh, I wasn't interested in, in music at all. I mean, I loved music, but I wasn't interested in music until I was a teenager. So when I was about 12 years old, I asked my father for lessons. And um, so it was just around then when I really liked music. I, I mean, I started to fall in love with music. And I started to think that maybe being a pianist would be something I'd like to do. And uh, that escalated really quickly. And I became completely obsessed with piano. My parents, they, they were fortunate enough to study abroad. So they studied in Rome, they studied in New York also, and they brought with them lots of records and lots of sheet music. So I had a very good uh, library of, of vinyls uh, long play albums and 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 sheet music. So um, what happened was that I started exploring these vinyls just on my own, and I started recognizing the music that my father used to play at the piano, or that my mother used to conduct. And this connection made me fall in love with music. So it became, as I said, my obsession. I could, I went to school, but before going to school, I woke up like at 5 a.m. in the morning just to practice some piano before I could go to school. And when I came back, I went straight to the piano to play. So I spent all my day at the piano, apart from school. So, mm. so I advanced quickly uh, and made up for the lost time from childhood when I didn't study any piano. And uh, basically I could say that my biggest influence in music have been my parents because they, uh, they nurtured this love for music that I, that I have. Okay, fascinating. And and uh, did you have access to a pretty nice piano growing up, or, or what kind of instrument did you get a chance to learn learn on? Well, uh, my father used to buy and sell pianos, so um, oh, really? he, we always had like different piano at home to practice, mostly uprights. Eventually, we got a very old uh, Blutner piano, uh, um, uh, a grand piano, uh, half mm -hmm. grand, and 
we stayed with that one for quite a while. Uh, but mostly I have been practicing in old German pianos, upright pianos, and at home. Okay, yeah. And are you familiar with Anders Piano out of out of? Lima? Yeah, of course I'm familiar with him. Yeah, he he is uh, he has been there like forever. Uh, He's like the main, the biggest or the most well-known uh, tuner and, and piano dealer in, in Lima. And I guess perhaps in Peru. But um, he also tunes the piano for the Philharmonic Society, where I uh, often give concerts. I will actually give a, a piano recital in, in a couple of months over there. And I always meet him over there. Okay, great. Yeah, I made friends with him when I was there. And... Um... We've talked about uh, we've talked about Anders piano on this program before. Incidentally, um, uh -huh. that was kind of one of the um, one of the encounters I had in my journeys, and I wrote some blog posts um, about about working with him. And yeah, we went out for some uh, some uh, ceviche a few times out there <laughs> in Lima. <laughs> He's a great nice. guy. Nice, nice. Um, that's awesome. Uh, um, well, you definitely have to meet Hernando as well, if you don't know Hernando, because I guess yeah, you, you would get along. Probably have to know some, some of the same people as well, because he was well connected in the music industry um, in Peru. Um, all right. Well, that's that's really fascinating. And uh, clearly you had a lot of rich you know, resources to work with as you were growing up. Yeah. Did the Bandoneon uh, come a part of your journey? With your parents did they introduce that to you or is that something that came um, later well, yeah yes but um <clears throat> by accident because uh when they were living in rome uh piazzola was also living in, and working in rome and he was very popular he became very popular because he made the the music for the world cup at that time that was mm. uh, played in argentina the soccer world cup and uh my parents got to know his music and and they liked it so much that they bought us Bought an album of Piazzolla, and many years later, I discovered this album at home, and I put it on, and and it was so amazing. I I loved the music immediately. I fell in love with him, the sound of the instrument, but I didn't even know how the instrument looked like because in Peru, bandoneon is not a traditional instrument. There's mm -hmm. more accordions, but not really bandoneonists. So I didn't even know how could I even get one, or or what it looked like, or how you could play one. So. Uh, it was kind of like a dream for me, like a daydream to be able mm. to play the band. And it stayed like that for a few years uh, until I was living in Finland at the time. Uh, I was about 20 years old and I decided to buy a bandonian. And I, I bought and I, that was the very first bandonian that I saw. The bandonian that I bought from Argentina, they sent it to to Finland. And I, my journey with the bandonian was solitary because in the beginning I didn't have any teachers. I was in a town up north in Finland called Lahti, and uh, a small city of about 40,000 people compared to Lima, which has several million people. It's uh, very small. And uh, as I said, there's, there was no Bandonian teacher or Bandonian player that I could uh, get any sort of advice from. So it was, uh, and there was no YouTube, there was no tutorials. So it, it was, I'm speaking about year 2002, more or less. Um, so I didn't have access to, to lots of, of information over there. But um, as I said, it was kind of an accident that my parents introduced me in this way to, to the Mandonian via Piazzolla's music. Okay, fascinating. Now, I feel like the Bandonio, it's not one of those instruments that uh, every, every kid in there, you know, as they're <laughs> developing... Uh, I mean, maybe the electric guitar or like the, you know, harmonic or the piano or whatever, the keyboards. Um, uh, I guess, uh, what's that experience like? I guess sort of having a feeling this such a resonant connection with an instrument um, that is is uh, so unique, I suppose. And, and I guess probably at some points, maybe or maybe not, you've made connections with others that have connections to that instrument you know how you know somebody grows up uh you know liking punk rock music but they're the only person in their high school that likes it and then all of a sudden they go off and they meet some other people and they get together and they kind of resonate they have this common thing did you have that with the bandonian or did you encounter a teacher at some point or has it kind of um, yeah. been a solitary passion 
Yeah. Yes. Well, it's that has happened only with other Vandonianists. So yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it, and and there are not very many Vandonianists in the world. So yeah, mostly the Vandonian is tr more traditional in, in Argentina, of course, because of the tango music, which is an Argentinian music, traditional Argentinian music. Uh, but the Vandonian is actually German. It's a German invention. And in Europe, there's a few places where there are some players, like, for example, in, in the Netherlands, where I also used to live, there's a few good Vandonian players also in France, especially in Paris and also in Germany. So um, sometimes when I visit these places, I I know who are the Vandonians over there because there, there, there are so few of them. And uh, eventually I meet them or sometimes uh, Vandonianists from Argentina fly over to Europe and uh, if they're in Madrid, they will contact me even if I even if they have never met me or spoken to me personally, but we are so few Bandonians that we know of our existence. So we get together in, mm -hmm. in whatever opportunities we have. I did get a teacher uh, when I was in Holland and uh, I studied for one year. I had already learned by myself how to play the instrument, but I perfected a lot of, uh, of, of details with this teacher, of course, because he he has been a professional bandonianist for forever and, and had begun playing the instrument since he was a child. So uh, he he is a great bandonianist, Victor Villena. He's one of the best bandonianists in, in the world. And um, so I got some great advice from him. Uh, but that was still a short time. It was one year. And um, I did learn a lot by playing in ensembles with other bandonianists. So uh, by playing together with, with people, you know, uh before in popular music um nowadays it's a bit different but um before everything kind of kind of was um education or or information was uh passed by in a kind of oral way in a traditional way in the sense that uh you learned by playing so you learned uh, mm -hmm. jazz players for example learned by playing with other jazz players you couldn't really go to to a music school to learn jazz. I mean, nowadays, of course, you can. But uh, when when jazz was still young and when tango was still young, um, musicians didn't mo many times didn't even know how to read music. So they learned kind of by playing and imitating others. And this is a way that uh, this is the way that I also learned and developed a lot to play by listening to others who played who were much more advanced than me and playing with them and learning from them. So this is a great way to learn. That's fascinating. Um, do you have, uh, by a chance, a Bandonian close at hand that you could, could yeah, hold up and show? Yeah. And, and maybe, yeah, could you just show for our audience a little bit, you know, what, what the yeah. instrument is made of? And it's sort of accordion-like. Um, yes, yeah. it's, it's a relative of the accordion and of the concertina. The concertina is actually like the forefather of the Bandonian. Uh, yeah. Only the Bandonian is bigger. I mean, it probably looks in the camera much bigger than what it actually is because it's closer, closer to the yeah. camera than what I am. But it's not really that big if you see it like this. However, mm -hmm. the bellows do expand quite much. So, oh wow, they go really, really large, and this allows for uh, very long lines. So you can uh, you can hold a note for a really, really long time. And um, another characteristic that it has is that uh, the keys change depending on whether you push or you pull the, the instrument. So, for example, uh, if I play a, uh, a chord uh, made up of these three notes, I don't know if you can hear that well. Yeah, I could hear it, yeah. So now I'm pulling uh, the bellows and these, if I press the same buttons while closing, it will sound like this. So it's absolutely different. The, the keyboard okay. is completely different depending on whether you push or pull, just like the concertinas or the harmonicas, you know, when you're blowing, uh, depending on whether you're uh, inhaling or exhaling the air, uh, the sound changes. So it's a bisonoric, it's known as a bisonoric instrument. Um, what I love about this instrument is that uh, it allows me to do what the piano cannot do, which is exactly what I said about the lines. You can you can uh, hold a single note for a really long time. You can make it expand or you can make it decrease. In the piano, the legato is um, an illusion. 
pianists have to uh, learn how to construct the illusion of a legato because as you know each as everybody probably knows each note decays immediately the sound decays immediately so we have we depend on our technique and the way that we produce the sound to be able to make a line that apparently is legato apparently each note is not uh, cut in the middle but on the bandonian it's physically possible just like a violin or just like the human voice so mm, this is the thing that I really love about the instrument is that I can do that with what I can't on the piano. So mm. that's uh, a little bit of, about the Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, and we could hear a little bit of the, I think Zoom filtered out a little bit of the sound, but uh, I think we heard a little bit of the chords as well. It's almost like the, and I've played a butt, like a butt in accordion or kind of like a, um, what was the first type, the German instrument that you mentioned? The concertina. Uh, the concertina. Um, yeah. And yeah, it is. It's like you're playing a completely different chord. It's like, like you're playing the next chord up in the in the sequence or something, pushing and pulling. So it's a lot to wrap your head around if you're coming from a, a very linear instrument like the piano, I suppose. Yes, um, it's very difficult. To, uh, the the, the bandonian is a very difficult instrument to learn to play because it has that and also the, the fact that you cannot see the keyboard so, because the keys are here to the sides. So you don't you don't have any vision towards the keyboards. So you have to actually memorize everything. And in the beginning, that's so hard. It it really takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. So you really have to be able. I mean, you really have to want to play it. Astor Piazzolla actually said um, that you have to be a bit crazy to play the bandonian. <laughs> I can't say it, yeah. Well. You seem sane enough, at least during this interview, but I can imagine you have your own uh, insanity. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get that side of things. I mean, I think even to be a musician and be dedicated to, um, you know, the arts, especially in our in modern times, you know, with all the, all the, you know, corporate structures around us, you know, pushing towards that kind of a lifestyle. Um, you got to be a little bit crazy as well for that. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, you really have to love what you do. If you, if there's no love with, and there's no even obsession, I'd say uh, it's very difficult to 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 continue on this path because it's 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 hard. Just like any just like anything, I think any profession or anything, you really need to to love it. Otherwise, uh, you'll fall behind, or you'll eventually give it up, or or you'll just be unhappy doing it. And it it will feel always as work and never as enjoyment. Yes, um, I've noticed here. You know, you mentioned you lived in Finland, and you mentioned other countries like Argentina, and you're in Spain right now. Um, you mentioned your parents spent some time in New York. You seem quite worldly that you've been that you've done quite a lot of travels. Um, can you tell me about? you know, how that came about? Is it just a sort of wanderlust, wanting to live in different places? Is it uh, professional opportunities? Is it touring? Um, what's brought you across the globe? Is it a mix of all of those things? Yeah, a, a mix of all of, of, of all of those things. In the beginning, it was, uh, of course, uh, I wanted to study abroad because uh, Peru is, especially during the time when I was a teenager, it was not the best place to be uh, musically. Uh, as a classical musician, which was what I was pursuing, classical music. Of course, there's fantastic folk music in Peru, which uh, and and fantastic uh, musicians that play folk, traditional music from there. But my area was classical music, and um, uh, people in Latin America, especially all around Latin America, want to go either to United States or to Europe to to study. In the, in the big, great conservatories where the greatest teachers are teaching, of course, and when they're, where everybody wants to go and there's so many great musicians around. So that's the, the best environment to, to learn because you, you're right in, in, in contact with people who, as I said before, are much more advanced than, than you and that's something to look up to uh, constantly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go abroad and um, I wanted to go to New York that didn't work out, unfortunately. Um, then I I tried, uh, I mean, I saw other options and I went to Finland because uh, in Finland, um, education is, or at least was during that time, it was free. Uh, it was for free, it was state um, financed. Uh, 
and I got a, a scholarship by sending a video uh, from the Lions Club uh, to to pay for my airfare, my ticket to go to get there. So that was completely adventurous because I, I had no more money. I mean, I had absolutely no money. So I uh, arrived in Finland. I would, had been admitted to the conservatory, of course, so I knew that I could study for free, but I had no money to live. So uh, I had to immediately find whatever job I could. So I worked in every imaginable thing. And um, that was the beginning. I, I was there four years. So I did my bachelor's degree in Finland until I was 22. Uh, then I moved to, to the Netherlands. I did my master's degree there. I did a, a diploma, which is um, like a postgraduate study after the master's in Paris for a year in, Le, in La Scuola Cantorum, a, a really old, uh, great school. And then I stayed in the Netherlands for, for a few years, just working. Uh, and eventually I moved to, to Madrid, to Spain. That was in 2013. Uh, where I live now, and uh, just because uh, I really love this place, not not because of any other reason. I wanted to live here. That that's it, and it was uh, for me. It was um, not really so important where I live because I my life consisted of touring. So uh, I've always been um, a concert artist. I've never been in, so involved in teaching. Uh, I did teach for a while when I was in Holland, uh, but it was just like a, a part-time job. Uh, I gave it up uh, because uh, I didn't have enough time for that. Um, I had to prepare for the concerts and everything, and, and my focus was always trying to, to be a concert artist, so trying to perform. And uh, so my, my studies took me to all these places, uh, but the concerts have taken me to over 30 countries around the world. So. Um, but, however, um, most of those places I don't really know because uh, I arrived there, I practice, I try the piano or I try the acoustics, I play and next morning I leave again. So I've actually been in, uh, in over 30 countries, but I know very few of them. Mm, okay. Interesting. And in terms of, in ter in terms of Madrid, you're in Madrid currently, right? In, in Spain. Yes. Um, tell me, uh, you may have mentioned it, and, and, but I just wanted to reiterate how you ended up there, how you settled in Madrid currently. Well, it's, uh, it was ju it's just a place that I, I really liked every time that I came here. I wasn't completely uh, comfortable in, in the place where I lived in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, um, because I, I wasn't really doing much in Holland. I was all, all the time traveling. Um, and it just felt a little bit more at home here in Madrid. Of course, it's my own, my mother tongue. Spanish is my mother tongue. Uh, and I have many, I had many friends here. So it, it was, it seemed like a better option for me to live here. And uh, I can easily get from Madrid to different places in the world, for example, uh, to Latin America. Uh, or to the United States, or also to to Asia, or uh, actually the whole world. Madrid is a really, really uh, great place as a central hub mm -hmm. to travel anywhere. Great. I have to visit Spain. I haven't been there, but I've got a lot of reasons to come. Um, and by the way, the artist, I couldn't think of his name before, uh, Chano Dominguez. Uh, oh, have you heard of Chano he's... Dominguez? Yes, he's a great pianist, very, very well known here in Spain. Yeah. Jazz pianist, so we, yeah. Jazz flamenco, yeah. Yes, yes. So we've had him on, on the radio hour a few times. In the podcast recently, we re we broadcast an episode actually with it featuring him. Um, yeah, uh, he's a really great guy. And, and uh, yeah. if you haven't had a chance to meet him, I, I recommend it. Um, so I wanted to talk to you, of course, you know, this show has a foundation of pianos and, and, and an audience of, of piano nerds, you know, a lot of piano technicians, people in the piano industry. Um, and so it's always uh, interesting to explore our guests, especially musicians, relationships with piano, the mechanics and like the, the, the people, you know, piano technicians and piano tuners. Um, what has been your relationship with that thus far? Do you is it one where you you, you haven't encountered a lot, or, or 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 you know you just kind of show up and the piano's ready, or 
Um, have you gotten to know any tuners and technicians or tried to learn about the piano's mechanics or anything? No, I mean, just the very basic stuff, but I, I wouldn't dare to try to my piano <laughs> or any other, anybody's piano, perhaps my enemy's piano. <laughs> 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 I haven't heard of that one before, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have any enemies, but I hope so. But uh, no, I re I really don't know because um, I think it's um, it's just something that that you really need to spend time to really master, and that's why there's people who who dedicate uh, exclusively to this. So I trust very much uh, my tuner. Uh, he's a great tuner. He tunes the uh, best calls here in, in Madrid and uh, very nice guy. So I'm lucky that I found him early on when I moved here and and, and, and that's it. And and then when, when I'm in, um, when I go to a concert, I'm, I don't know, I don't really have much relationship with, with, with tuners. Sometimes they just ask me a few things, but usually it's, uh, it's just a really a, a, a brief, polite encounter with the tuner. So I, I don't really have much relationship with that world, unfortunately, though. But because I, I'd love to know more. I mean, there's some pianists, for example, Grigory Sokolov is well known for being very specific and very uh, meticulous about the mechanics of the piano and and knowing everything about it. And, and, and it goes with his obsessive personality and his great perfectionist. And that's why he's such a, an amazing musician of course in in that sense uh but i i don't have that um, um mental or time capacity to to focus on that because i'm i'm focused on other things got it well your piano is open there so you'll probably pick up a few things about the mechanics i suppose <laughs> um, well yes of course in, my father was really uh, a, a great um mind when it came to these kind of crafts so but he always did everything himself. He knew how to tune his piano. He added weight to the keys by um, oh. with uh, by drilling holes and putting some uh, self-made um, uh, weights and uh -huh. all sorts of stuff. So I've observed him doing this thing. So I mean, if something breaks, like if a hammer goes out of, out of place, or sometimes uh, a hammer goes a little bit to the side and it touches a little bit of of the of the the string the, the string right next to it so two note sound so i know how to regulate it so that it goes back to its place just by observing it so but that's i think very basic stuff so do you uh, recollect your do you recollect your piano technician's name in in uh, madrid there yes david izquierdo david, david izquierdo okay. yes mm -hmm. okay cool we'll have to look him up Maybe we'll try to get him on the program as well. Um, yeah, actually, he, he has his own company uh, now that his son and daughter are also piano technicians. So they handle like uh, maybe 50 percent of the piano of all of the pianos in Madrid. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's fascinating to at this program and some of our other educational activities have given me a chance to know you know, people in pianos all over the world, which I've really appreciated. Um, in, in Finland, I know piano technicians there. Um, there's a woman named Kirsi Lassi, uh, who was one of our, our first uh, kind of enthusiastic participants in our master classes. Um, and uh, yeah, Peru, you know, uh, we have Chile, Chilean piano technicians who tune into this program, for example. Um, uh, and have you have you familiar with Clavin's pianos, David Clavin's? No. I recommend you check that out. Um, Where is that? In what country? Um, he's in um, Latvia currently, but I, I'm not sure if that's where he's from originally. But back in the 80s, he designed an entirely new type of piano. It's a vertical piano uh, that you had to climb a staircase to play. So it's it's the strings and the soundboard are, are as large or larger than your typical concert grand piano, um, wow. but it's a vertical vertical instrument and um, and he sort of had went to the traditional piano building school uh, and came out of it you know saying hey wait a second some of the things they're teaching me they're kind of like sidestepping what's really going on I think I could design a piano that you know has has different qualities that will fulfill 
you know, better scaling and, and things like this, have a better base, uh, base range and, and stuff like that. And he kind of invented this new type of piano. And then um, he's been making those ever since. And more recently, uh, he's been creating smaller versions. So he has this Unicorda 64 key piano with, with only a single string per note. Um, but yeah, just, you know, getting a chance to, to interface with all sorts of people all over the world. I've, I've always uh, appreciated uh, cross-culturalism yeah. and this program gives us the opportunity for that. So That sounds so interesting. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, tell me a little bit more about kind of what's going on uh, with you now in terms of, you know, what are your focuses in, in your projects, you know, things you think people should pay attention to or what's coming down the line, stuff like that. Well, um, I'm all, always um, thinking of new ways to reach more people um, with music, of course. Uh, my my greatest um, uh, uh, motivation, yeah, my greatest motivation is to to perform music, to play music, and and to reach people with music, to touch people's uh, hearts with music uh, to sound a little bit uh, cliche but <laughs> that's really what i focus on and i like to explore all sorts of technologies for that that's why uh, i become so active in social media and so active in youtube and on my newsletter which i write uh, a daily newsletter and um so i i basically um work a lot i focus a lot on recording music at home and uh and and showing that through the various uh, channels various media of course i perform a lot of concerts but i'm trying to keep them um i'm trying to keep uh, a, a, a less tight agenda because i've traveled so much uh now that i have a family now that i have a, a young daughter uh, I like, I enjoy being home so much and um, it's, it gets harder to, to leave. Uh, so I, I love uh, being on stage. It's kind of what I was meant to do, to be on stage and perform on stage. Uh, but I don't have the need to do it as often as I did before. So before I really played every single week, I had a concert, sometimes more concerts per week. So that's, that was a really large agenda. Uh, but now I've uh, tightened it uh, more. I'm, I'm more at home and I uh, enjoy it more that way because each concert becomes sort of more special and uh, I prepare more specifically for each uh, moment, for each concert, each program. I focus better on each program because since I play two instruments and different genres, uh, my programs, are, my concerts uh, uh, vary very much um, uh, in in mood and in general, so uh, one day I might be playing uh, Bach on the Bandonian, the other next day I might be playing Piazzolla, next day I might be playing a Beethoven sonata, then a concerto with an orchestra. So it's it can get quite chaotic um, it, it, with the schedule just to practice and learn these pieces, you know, and and get them in in, in good shape. Uh, that's why I'm focusing so much on uh, on these new channels to to expand. Uh, the the viewer amount actually because uh i've got some videos which have reached seven or eight million people so that's something that is not possible to do on a concert of course so um and i've uh gotten so many uh encouraging messages from from people who for example have had given up on their instruments and are picking uh, them up again uh, or who are uh, discovering new composers or discovering new music that they didn't know before or are even discovering classical music because of, of these videos which are, will become viral so that's something i i really really enjoy so and, and i'm i'm focusing a lot on that because i think it it brings a lot of uh of value to to people around the world just like mm -hmm. i like consuming uh things i'm i'm not um I don't have a TV, so I don't I don't watch Netflix. I don't watch any of these, but I I'm an avid YouTube consumer because I find so much gems over there, uh, musical gems, or or I learn every day something from there. So this is a, a kind of environment that I want to be part of, and I am part of it. So this is a, a something I concentrate on daily. Uh, apart from that, uh, I develop my projects, my recording projects. Um, I'm uh, 
so I, I signed to Warner Classics, so I released one album with Warner Classics on the Bandonium uh, that was last year. Uh, I'm planning my next one, which is going to be with the piano and the Vendonian and an orchestra. And uh, so this is I'm going to be touring that in next year, 2025, 2026. Uh, so these are kind of my projects. And of course, just performing uh, the music that I love to perform. Mm -hmm. well, that's a lot. Um, when did you get started with the YouTube? Um, and I'm, I'm assuming as, as anyone might, you, you know, you start putting things on YouTube and you think, oh, it'd be great if a lot of people see it, you know, and you kind of hope for that, but also, you know, probably hedge your bets like you might, might not. like, what, you know, how long has it been? And, um, you know, do you feel like um, it was kind of like a surprise to to get, get get such a response or is it just kind of a long time building up the, you know, your, your channel or yeah, how, how did, how, what was that like? Well, um, on YouTube, uh, I did start my channel many years ago, but uh, it was the typical musician's channel where you just uploaded uh, every once in a while some video, of some perform, some random performance. So it was not really. Um, I mean, YouTube is a is a platform which you really need to to know how it works in order for your videos to to get some sort of exposure. So. Uh, in terms of the algorithm, of course, just like uh, the other social media platforms. Um, my real actual uh, YouTube journey as a creator, as a creator focused on doing YouTube videos, has started really recently, um, perhaps one year ago or so. And uh, it has been just since uh, about October that I've adopted the um, the the habit of, of doing uh, regular videos, the uploading regular videos on YouTube and, and really putting effort into do, doing them uh, visually pleasant. And you have some really beautiful, I mean, just, just to interrupt and say that we, we talked about maybe playing some of your music as part of the program and we decided, well, there's plenty of your stuff out there so people can look you up, you know, of course, and they can find your videos. But yes, you have some very beautifully created, crafted videos you know, not just from the musical perspective, the recording quality is very good, but visually it's, you know, it's very pleasing. Um, just to make that thank comment, you. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, it has been a, a, a learning process, uh, of course, because um, there's so, you see the end product, but uh, there's much work behind that uh, to get to that point, you know, to decide what kind, what sort of aesthetic am I going to use, what, what music am I going to play, uh, how am I going to record it, uh, how am I going to edit and master it and mix it, and, and what sort of color grading am I going to use. So all of this is, is a lot of information, which uh, once you, you get used to it, then you can do it, the workflow becomes uh, more quick, more effective. But in the beginning, it takes a lot of time. And of course, you get no views, you get no, nobody watches your video. So this is something that eventually comes. So you really need to, to keep up there with the consistency and, and, and believe in that it, someday it will work if you just do better videos all the time. Uh, on YouTube, I, I'm growing uh, uh, quite a lot, but uh, it's not the place where I'm absolutely viral. Uh, I'm really viral in Instagram. Mm -hmm. There's where I get really millions of views, and on Instagram I've been more active since earlier, so perhaps uh, since a couple of years, uh, since the pandemic, after after the pandemic actually, since after the pandemic, I became very active over there. So I've uh, amassed a very large following, uh, of almost half a million followers, and uh, many viral videos, and uh, and I'm very proud of that because I do it with just with music, you know, just with classical music, with the music that I love. Well, not only classical music, of course, some other uh, genres, but mostly classical music. Yeah, I mean, that's great. And it's great uh, to see classical music getting such, a, you know, activity. Right. And I think it's, yeah. sometimes it's hard to find that target uh, location to to have classical music performance and appreciation because there is a demand for it but it's like you got to have the right context right you have the right framing um framing for it as well <laughs> because, yeah yeah it, it's a combination of a lot of factors to make it work exactly uh, i will um i'm gonna pause this right here as part of the conversation i actually have to change locations momentarily um okay. we'll start it back up for a minute and then we'll wrap up we're almost done i think 
All right, we're back, everyone. Um, I just had to change locations, and uh, I guess that's that's probably for the best because uh, I didn't mention it during our interview, but uh, I'm here in Disney World right now with my family, taking a break to do this program, and so you get to see the uh, the good old Cinderella's castle in the background and uh, and get the Disney vibe uh, while while I'm here as well as we wrap things up. And I think luckily my headset is good enough that you're not going to get overwhelmed by the the musical and entertainment uh, ruckus that they put on over here <laughs> um so so yeah i mean it, it's been it's been interesting hearing about your journey through social media i think um i really think that's wonderful and uh we've had some other people on the program as well that are having similar success and, and that's always good to hear i guess you know it's probably appropriate time to just go ahead and share like the the handles that that people might go to check out, you know, YouTube, Instagram, you know, whatever other places that uh, people might find you in your website. Uh, what what are good places for people to find you? Well, um, Instagram is the the main platform I use. Um, uh, I, I use it the most often, so I publish there almost every day. My uh, name over there is Constantini Music. Beware, because there's lots of fake accounts uh, using my name. Oh. So okay. check the one that has the blue tick. That's the only one that is really me. And um, you can find me on uh, on TikTok as well. But uh, I do that content in, in Spanish. It's the only platform where I do it in, in Spanish, because TikTok is uh, location based. And since I'm in Spain, it mostly reaches uh, people in Spain. That's why I do it in Spanish. Hmm. While on Instagram, I post everything in English. Uh, YouTube, of course, is the, the the platform I'm most dedicated to this year to grow. I want to grow on YouTube much more because that's the place where you can put the long format videos. So you can put a full performance of a full piece, which is uh, ideal. Uh, my name there is also Constantini Music, uh, just like everywhere else. Uh, on Facebook, I have a Facebook page as well, Constantini Music. Uh, that's about it. I have my daily newsletter. Uh, you can sign up in my website, which is claudioconstantini.com. And uh, that's it. That's it. All right. Excellent. Um, and I guess oh, yeah. uh, you can look me up in Spotify as well, of course, and, and Apple Music and Amazon, just by my name, Claudio Constantini, to listen to my releases. Beautiful. Um, and I guess just maybe to wrap uh, as, a, as a final topic or question, um, you know what is your what is your take on the landscape of music and being a musician being an artist these days you know you've you've gotten a chance to um you know sort of live through different uh eras of music you know you you said you got you know when you got started you couldn't find youtube videos on the band Neonia, for example <laughs> um and and finally you can and you sort of finding a niche you know with with social media after having toured the world and things like this you know, what if you see somebody that's, you know, in their teens or entering sort of that university age or they're starting their career and they're they're creative, they have a connection with a quirky instrument or whatever. Well, you know, what do you how do you recommend people go about um, making a career, making a life with these kind of interests, pursuits, careers, things like that? Well, that's a that's a very complicated question to answer, because, of course, uh, it depends very much on the individual. It depends very much on uh, on who it is, where where he or she is, uh, what do they want, what do they... I think a, a good place to start is um, trying very hard. I know it's it's difficult, especially when you're young, it's very difficult to, to picture yourself uh, in where you're going to be at in, in five or ten years, because it's so, so, such a long road up, all the way up till there, but... Um, I think it's important to to think about that because um, when I was studying music, when I was a, a young student, I wanted to become a concert pianist, just like uh, my idols, just like Rubinstein or Horowitz or Richter or uh, Marta Argerich or any of these great uh, pianists. And uh, the reality is that their time, the, the time when they became idols, when they became iconic uh, music figures was absolutely different to the time that I was living at the moment uh, in, in the two, early 2000s 
when I was studying at the conservatory. And uh, and the, the time now is different from what it was then, because it's all, all the time evolving. The market is evolving, the uh, music is evolving, uh, the, the way that people consume music is evolving, artificial intelligence is coming. So there's plenty of things that might change the landscape of, uh, of what um, professional musicians might be used to at the moment. So what I uh, would suggest to anybody, be it a young musician or, or uh, of the musician of any age is to be very open and, uh, and keep the prejudices aside of any sort of new technologies, practices, and, and stuff, because um, things change really, really quickly. And uh, at the end, there's two ways of uh, being a musician, uh, uh, being an amateur musician or being a professional musician. And the main difference that, uh, that I see, of course, there's many, but, and this might sound cold, but the main difference that I see is, uh, in one of them you do it because just because you like it and in the other one you actually make a living out of it it doesn't mean that you don't like it you you should like it but you're making a living out of it and 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 in the end if you want to make a living out of it you have to think what is it that you can do or that you're going to do that will allow you to make a living out of it so um planning ahead you know do you like teaching uh, that's a good uh way to go study some pedagogics you don't like teaching or you're you you do not think you're good in teaching or whatever then focus on uh building a career as a performer as i did how can you do that well that's very personal it depends where you are who you know um what are you able to do what are your personal unique personal skills what makes you unique uh, harvest that but also learn a lot about the people who who um who are more advanced than you or the people who have actually um achieved things so uh, this is also something that uh i wish somebody would have told me before um when you get advice uh, from people uh it's it's good to analyze uh, the results that that person has had and so, so sometimes you get um very um how do you say very strict advice from somebody who maybe has no results from what he's he or she is preaching you know and uh it's it's important to to know that as well you know to to have some kind of vision i'm saying so many things and they're so general and broad so as i said, <laughs> as I said it, it really depends on the person so but uh basically keeping an eye open keeping an open mind and uh and questioning things all the time and then and trying to improve and be very honest if you love what you do uh, because if you don't if you feel that this is not the right thing for you and um, uh, you have to really question yourself and, and find the truth on, on that yeah yeah i appreciate you giving giving a good shot at that i mean it's to be honest it's a, <laughs> it's a complicated world to to be, be an artist in but i think some takeaways that i have there which are very valuable you know one being open minded and and knowing that things are changing and that you know you, you should have an eye for that that's that's one thing i'm taking away um another is is really identifying within yourself you know do you want to be a professional or not <laughs> you know and if you are you, you know you have to take it seriously in terms of yeah. where does the money come from and uh and i think that advice piece is very useful i think i made the same realizations you know i took business advice from my friends and I thought, well, you know what, I want to take business advice from people who are successful business people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because you know, there, you yeah. get so, many, so much advice from, from, uh, musicians who, you know, it cannot earn a living from, uh, from what they right. do. And, 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 and it's good, it's good to focus and to really, uh, delve your, uh, into the music and into learning as much as you can into the music. But uh, if you're locked in, in a room studying piano for 12 uh, hours a day for four years, when you get out of the conservatory, you don't know how to do much anything else, uh, much less how to run a business out of your music. Because at the end, if you want to live out of it, you, you have to run a business in a way, even if some people don't feel comfortable with that word because they have kind of negative connotations uh some people think that when you think of money or when you think of business in art in any sort of art you cheapen the art but i don't think 
it has anything to do. I mean, it's just a matter of, of, of offering great value to people. You should always offer great value and the best possible and getting uh, uh, economical compensation for that so that you can live. It's, it's as basic and as simple as that, not, not anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I heard somebody else put it in terms of advice. You know, it, it, seeing what kind of results they have, that's a, a piece of it. But I think the other perspective that I got that I think is useful is just think about where they're coming from. That's all. You know, I mean, may have good advice and not be getting results or, you know, be bad advice and be getting results, whatever. But where are they coming from? What's their context? And then and then you can do with it what you like. You know, it's your decision how to how to proceed and, and analyze things. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate you taking a stab at that uh, complicated question to end it with. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, thank you very much, uh, Claudio. It's really been a pleasure. Um, I hope we get to speak again soon. And I'll I want to subscribe to your newsletter. I, I'm I'm excited to see you know kind of what what you're up to and what you're keeping up with every day. And um, and uh, I commend you for for kind of pursuing this unique path and and sort of bringing life to this instrument that not a lot of people get exposure to. Um, it's really wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan. This has been a great pleasure talking to you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you guys for joining. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, as always, uh, you can find more about us on pianotechmasterclass.com or pianotechradio.com. Um, hopefully we will see you again next week. Thank you all for joining. Bye. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.